Are you talking about the AP exam practice, the homeworks? You're probably talking about all. Um, I will leave it up to you. Um, you can email them in if you want. Anything you guys owe me, you are welcome to email it in, and I will pull it up on my iPad and look at it there and give you the credit. Or um, you can wait. If you don't want to go through that hassle, you can just wait and show me when you get back. The only difference is, yes, I will put zeros in along the way, but you guys know the those are fully recoverable. So I don't really care which way. I wouldn't worry about the AP exam practice one yet until I have the people in class turn theirs in because if we do any more questions, I want you guys to, you know, all be able to benefit from those questions. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, unless we, you know, if we talk about questions at the end, which honestly this lesson may take a little bit anyways, but if we talk about questions at the end, we get to talk, turn in the AP exam, we can do that also, but I don't guarantee we'll get that turned in today. We'll see. That one's actually probably more important to go over than lesson 61, 62, really. So, okay. And I just realized you guys aren't hearing half of this conversation. <laughs> oh, well. The question is just about should they turn in their homework via email or not. So it doesn't affect you guys right now. And hopefully it won't, right? Yeah. <laughs> Interesting enough, all three of you are masked today. <laughs> I will say, you know, I was in Lafayette. I was around all these people I'm not normally around. I wore my mask all day yesterday just because... I don't know what germs I have since we're having such a big outbreak here at school. I don't know what germs, you know, all these other schools are having big outbreaks too. And I thought if I'm going to be around all these other teachers, these textbook vendors. Yeah, I wore my mask yesterday just because I was like, you know, there's a lot of germs. Okay. Lesson 63. Here we go. Finally. Lesson 63 is our critical number and closed interval theorem. So I'm going to start by trying to introduce a little bit about um, a couple of theorems, and then we're going to work to see how they affect everything, you know, how we can use them and whatnot. There are a lot of theorems in math, uh, or in AP calculus. There's a lot of theorems, and some of them we just kind of talk about, and we just need to be, you know, aware that that's possible. There are others that, you know, sometimes you have to be able to mention them by name. And I'm not sure necessarily that either of these you have to be able to mention by name, but there are some as we go through that when you do open-ended AP questions, you need to be able to mention, you know, mention those by name. So, okay, let's start by talking about the maximum minimum value existence theorem. Okay, so first of all, it's an existence theorem, which means it's just saying that whatever we're talking about in this case exists. In this case, we're referring to maximum and minimums. So maximum minimum value existence theorem. If F is continuous, so first of all, that quality has to be met, okay? That characteristic has to be met. If F is continuous on the closed interval I, and I is being defined as A to B, okay? So I just, just stands for interval. This interval is defined as A to B. Then F attains a maximum value, capital M, and a minimum value, little m, on I, so on the interval. Did you get all that? So this is a maximum, minimum value existence theorem. This one's a big deal. F has to be continuous. And when I mean continuous, if you want the real basic definition, this isn't really the calculus definition, but... If I put my pencil down and I can draw the whole thing without ever having to lift it up, that's continuous, right? So if it's continuous on the closed interval A to B. So for this example here, I'm going to give that beginning point as A, that ending point is B. Okay, so if this function is continuous, this is continuous from A to B, my graph is one motion, right? Then F must, basically it's saying that there exists a maximum and a minimum value on this curve. Now, if this is just a straight line somehow, then the maximum and minimum value could be the same. But they're just saying that if you have a continuous graph 
on a certain interval, at some point there's a max, at some point there's a minimum. That's what this existence um, value is saying, or existence theorem is saying. Now, curiosity. Where do you think the max is? B? Did you guys catch that? Okay. This right here, this hill, right, is a maximum. But it'd be a local maximum, right? Whoops. What is the maximum from A to B? Well, it is B. Okay? Your maximum is right there. Now, if you have that in mind, where's your minimum? It happens to be at A, doesn't it? Okay? Little M is at A. And I feel like, I go back because I feel like my uppercase M. I made more like cursive-y, and so it was hard to tell there. But, and this will lead into, I don't think we talked, oh, we do talk to about to talk about today. This maximum minimum value existence theorem, it leads into the fact that if you are on a set interval, and we're talking max and mins, you need to be sure to include your endpoints. Could that endpoint be a max or a min? It could. And those, if you have an equation of a graph, those aren't necessarily going to be found by looking at first derivative and critical points. So that's what we need to look at there. Now, that leads us right into critical number theorem. Notice, on this critical number theorem, what does it start off saying? If f is a continuous function. Okay, so if f is a continuous function on a closed interval i, remember the difference between open and closed? If it's a closed interval, kind of like what we had up here, this is a closed interval because a and b are included, as opposed to an open interval where you use parentheses and the endpoints are not included. So basically if we're talking about an interval where the endpoints are included, thus closed, and if f attains a maximum or minimum value at x equals c, where c is a part of the interval, so some third value c there, there's a maximum or minimum there, then either, here are the possibilities. Like here, c could be an endpoint. If we were talking about a max here, c could be an endpoint. So that's one option. Okay. Another option is that the first derivative at C does not exist. And that would be in respect, I believe, to more like your hard points there, where you can't take the derivative at like when I, you guys know what I mean by not a curve, but more of a hard point, okay? Or the derivative equals zero at that point. So three options here if we're trying to talk about max and mins. Max and min could be at an endpoint. It could be where the derivative does not exist, so like at a hard point. It could be where the derivative equals zero, which normally, where has it been up until this point? A max and min happens when the derivative, derivative equals zero. Okay? But now we're talking about on a specific closed interval, and we have to throw those endpoints in. Best thing is, my guess, for me to try an example and look at some options here. Okay. Now oh, I really should have had this up on the other screen, but key point before we go into example one. To find maximum minimum values over an interval, we have to find critical numbers. So we have to find where the derivative equals zero and then check those. So check your critical points and what else? Endpoints to see which ones, there went the earring, to see which ones are the maximums and which ones are the minimums. Okay, so if you're on a closed interval, 
Don't just check critical points, check endpoints as well. Example one, find the maximum and minimum values of f of x given this equation on the interval negative two to four. So without the interval, if they didn't give us this interval, how would we find our maximum minimums? Derivative set equal to zero. And we find our critical points this way. Now we need to also consider specifically this interval, which means we also have to check the endpoints. So basically, in, instead of however many critical points we have here, we have two more critical points to check, and those are the endpoints. Okay. Um, let's start. I'm going to start over here. Let's start with the derivative. What is the derivative of this function? Did you guys get what I got? 6x squared minus 6x minus 12. Set that derivative equal to 0. What do you notice about that equation real quick? They all divide by 6, don't they? I would factor or divide out a 6. It'll make life easier. So if I factor out a 6, I have x squared minus x minus 2. So 6 times that value equals 0. And at this point, I factored out the 6. Technically, you could divide out the 6, couldn't you? Because it's an equation, I can divide both sides by 6. And that 6 is just a number. It's not going to matter. What do we need to do with x squared minus x minus 2? Factor it. x squared is x times x. If it multiplies to be negative 2 and adds to be negative 1. It's 1 and 2, negative 2, positive 1. And of course, we're going to set each part equal to 0. x plus 1 equals 0. x minus 2 equals 0. I'm not worrying about the 6 because there is no x with it. If there's an x with it, we'd worry about that. So we have critical points at x equals negative 1 and positive 2 are my critical points, correct? Based on the derivative equaling 0. What are all the points I need to check to find my max and my min here? But I need to check negative 1. I need to check 2. What else do I need to check? Negative 2. Uh-huh. Negative 2 and 4 because we also have to include our endpoints. Okay. Now, and this would be a non-graphing type problem, so I'm not going to go to the calculator and plug it into the graph. How am I going to find out where the max and the min are at? Can we do the second for the need to, or? We don't want to think second derivative because, again, we're looking at those endpoints okay. and so throwing the input. Because the thing is, endpoints at negative 2 and 4, they could be our max and min. But even if they are our max or min, are they like the top of a mountain or the bottom of a valley necessarily? They could be just stopped in the middle of a graph. 
And so doing like a second derivative test isn't going to help me then. Um, again, we don't want to check increasing, decreasing. This is answering Ross's question. We don't want to check increasing, decreasing on either side because, again, with my endpoints, they could be increasing on both sides or decreasing. Uh, you know, it's not necessarily a traditional max where you would draw a mountain or a valley or a traditional min, I mean. But at this point, and I heard Shively say it, we want to plug the values in. We want to start plugging the values in and seeing where is the highest point, where is the lowest physical point. Now, if we're trying to find the max and min, these are max and min on the original equation. Okay, because if we plug these critical points into the derivative, these two are going to give me zero. So we want to plug in to the original f. And we're going to plug in, I guess it doesn't matter what order we go in, negative one. We're going to plug in two. I'm going to plug in negative two. And I'm going to plug in 4. And again, it's all because the endpoints, they could be the highest or the lowest point, but it could just be in the middle of an increasing line or something. Okay, so if I plug in, we're plugging into right here, yes, into F. If I plug in negative 1, negative 2, minus 3, plus 12, plus 1. Check my math here. I got 8. And again, for the benefit of, you know, what you're doing here in homework or on your own, could you plug these into the calculator knowing full well you might not be able to use the calculator here? You could. Okay. If I plug in 2, because this is real quick getting, do I want, how much of this do I want to spend my time on? And I'm already running behind. If I plug in 2, I don't know if you guys have gotten it or not. I have negative 19. If I plug in negative 2, I have negative 3. If I plug in 4, I have 33. Where is my max? Yeah, 33 is my highest y value. So depending on how you're writing this, my max occurs when x equals 4 on this interval, and the maximum value is 33. What did they ask me for? They asked me for the maximum and minimum values. So I'm going to say my max value is 33. What's my min value? Yeah. My minimum value is occurring at negative 19. Or not, excuse me, I said that wrong. My minimum value is negative 19. It occurs when x is 2. So if we were to look at the graph, the endpoint of 4, that's going to be higher than anything on the interval from negative 2 to 4. Okay? And then 2, when x equals 2, that's going to be your lowest point on the graph, on the interval from negative 2 to 4. So it's going to be lower than either of the endpoints as well. Questions there? Okay. Moving along. Okay. Are you ready for example two? A 10 inch long string is to be cut into two pieces. 
One of the pieces will be bent to form a square. The other piece will be formed into a circle. Find where the string should be cut to maximize the combined area of the circle and the square. What? I don't know that I would use the word bend a string other than just form a square. I don't know. Okay, so what are we trying to do here? We are trying to maximize the combined area. Yes? And let's see. I'm trying to think how I want to put this on here. We have a 10 inch string, yes? The string goes from zero to 10. And it is to be cut into two pieces. There's my random cut, okay? Maybe it's equal pieces, maybe it's not, who knows? The string is to be cut into two pieces. One of the pieces will be bent to form a square, the other a circle. Um, and then find where to cut to maximize combined area. This 0 to 10. We're going to break it into two pieces. I'm going to call this first piece X. If I call this first piece X, how could I use X to name this second piece? Based on my fact that my whole string is 10 long. Yeah, so the second piece, I'm going to call 10 minus x. So I have an x and I have a 10 minus x. One of these pieces forms a circle. The other piece forms a square. Now, I don't know technically that it wouldn't matter. I mean, officially it could be done both ways. But based on what I've done, I'm going to say that this piece right here x is going to form my circle. I'm going to say the 10 minus x is going to form my square. Now, with that in mind, okay, this string goes around the edge of the circle, yes? What's the formula that's going to take this string around the edge of the circle? What are we talking about? We're talking about around the circle. Circumference. circumference, right? So what is the circumference of a circle? Two pi r is one version. Pi d would be the other version. I have two pi r in my notes, so I'm going with that one. Okay. How do you find the distance around the square? Officially, it's perimeter. If I call, this is traditional, you see this in math, one side of the square S, what is the perimeter of that square? 4S. Okay. So perimeter being 4S. Now, again, you guys have done these maximization form, you know, think problems before. We have to work to get one equation all in terms of the same variable. Obviously, I'm going to be using x here. So what I'm going to do here on this first one, we're talking about the circle. The formula is 2 pi r. What did I say from the string? 2 pi r is going to equal the x piece of the string. And so I'm going to say... 2 pi r equals x. I want everything in terms of x here. So, if I want this in terms of x, r is the other variable. How do I solve for r? Divide by 2 pi. And r is 
x divided by 2 pi. Similar step for the square. What piece of string was I using for the square, though? The 10 minus x. And the 10 minus x goes around the square as 4s. So I'm going to say 10 minus x. Or wait, do I want to write that the other way? Probably should have written that the other way. Whoops. I'm going to change that and write that as 4s. Dang it. Okay. 4s. I guess it wouldn't matter now that I think about it. Oh, well. 4s equals 10 minus x. I want it in terms of x. The other variable is s. So how do I solve for s? Divide by 4. So then I'm going to write it as 10 minus x over 4. Okay. What are we trying to maximize here? Area. So. Area of a circle. What's that formula you're supposed to know? Pi r squared? Hmm. I'm going to run out of room. Okay, so area is pi r squared, correct? Now, except I don't want it in terms of r, because we're going to put everything in terms of x. So what am I subbing in for r? x over 2 pi. I was just looking to see how I have this written in final form. So it's pi times x over 2 pi quantity squared. Whoops. Okay. I would clean that up a little bit and that is what x squared over 4 pi squared. But notice one of the pi's will, will go away. Okay, we'll cancel. And so then I have x squared over 4 pi. And so if I say x squared over 4 pi, however, I have it written here as 1 over 4 pi times x squared. So that it is x squared over 4 pi. I think you guys could all get to that. But I'm going to write it as 1 over 4 pi times x squared so that I can see, my, see what my coefficient is. Repeat the process for the square. How do you find area of a square? And I should have said with side length s is going to be s squared, right? But what am I using for s? 10 minus x over 4. So this is 10 minus x over 4 quantity squared. We are going to have to FOIL that top out. For this step, I'll still leave it as one big fraction, which means 4 on bottom, 4 squared is going to be 16 on bottom. On top, when I FOIL, 10 minus x times 10 minus x. 10 times 10 is... 100, then you're going to have a minus 10x and another minus 10x, so that's going to be minus 20x, and then you're going to have a 
plus x squared. We have two area formulas, yes? Okay, well, that's the hard work in getting to our starting, you know, our big formula. Combined area means I'm going to have to add these two together. I don't even know what to say at this point. <laughs> Are you guys watching my craziness here? It wouldn't draw. Ugh. Okay. It just adds to my day, you know? It just goes with my day. <sighs> okay. So my area formula is going to be this, those two messes added together, right? Now, the first one I've already kind of got set up in a good form for us. And then I'm going to say it is 1 over 4 pi times x squared plus I'm trying to get a setup for the next step if you will okay and as I'm trying to get a setup for the next step I'm gonna go ahead and make this three separate terms down here so each term's gonna go over 16 100 over 16 I could technically go ahead and reduce 100 over 16 Divide top and bottom by 4. And I'm going to say 25 fourths minus 20x over 16. 20 and 16. Divide by 4 and it's 5 fourths x. plus x squared over 16, I'm going to say 1 16th x squared. Okay. I've got to speed up our class today. Oh, my goodness. We're trying to maximize combined area, guys. What do we officially have to do? Derivative, right? We've got to find these critical points. And I'm going to go ahead and do the derivative in the form we're in. I'm not going to try and add those x squared terms right now because it's not going to help. So I'm going to call this a prime. Derivative of 1 over 4 pi times x squared. So multiply by 2, and it's 2 over 4 pi, right? But 2 over 4 reduces to be 1 over 2 pi. So I'm going to say 1 over 2 pi times x. The derivative of 25 fourths, 0. Minus the derivative of 5 fourths x, is 5 fourths. Plus the derivative of 1 16th x squared. Multiply by 2, it's 2 16ths, which is 1 8th times x. And officially, if we're trying to find critical points, we're going to set this equal to 0. Now, as we set this equal to 0, x is on one side, constant's on the other side. So I'm going to keep 1 over 2 pi x and 1 8 x on the left. I'm booting out my minus 5 fourths. So if it's minus 5 fourths on the left, I'm going to add 5 fourths on the right. And we have two x terms here, don't we? I'm just looking at what's best to do. As I look at these two x terms, I probably really need to be set up to add them. And which way did I do it here? Yeah. If you have 1 over 2 pi and 1 over 8, how do you add 1 over 2 pi and 1 over 8? 
And what would have a common denominator there between 2 pi and 8? 2 and 8 would be 8, and then you have to have a pi, right? So let's do a common denominator of 8 pi. First fraction we have to multiply by 4. So 4 over 8 pi times x, plus the other one is just 1 over 8, so we just have to multiply by pi. So pi over 8 pi times x. still equals 5 fourths. What is this fraction going to look like when I add 4 over 8 pi plus pi over 8 pi? Four plus pi over eight pi, and then I'm just going to say times x at the end. In other words, that's my coefficient at that point. Four plus pi over eight pi times x, and that equals five fourths. In order to solve for x, we do need to multiply by the reciprocal. Okay, if I multiply by the reciprocal, get out of my way. Okay, we're going to have the 5 fourths, correct, times the reciprocal, which is 8 pi over 4 plus pi. Now, as I look at my notes, it appears at this point I went to a decimal. Since I'm really quickly running out of time, and we still have a whole backside, can I tell you the decimal, I assume? I have 4.3990. Okay. What is that value I just found? No. Not talking about a label here. A critical point. <laughs> We're not done yet. Thus, I'm a little stressed. I'm a lot stressed. Sorry. Okay. That is a critical point. Now, find where the string should be cut to maximize the combined area of the circle and the square. You can remember it all anything I've taught today. I know. We've done a lot in just this one problem here. We found a critical point. We're trying to maximize the area. Is that necessarily the max? No, because what else do we need to consider? What'd you say? I was gonna say zero and ten. Why zero and ten? What are they? They are the endpoints. So yes, you need to consider zero. 10 as the endpoints and that critical point of 4.3990. So, yes, we have critical points at x equals 0, 4.3990, and 10. How do I consider these critical points? We're going to plug them into the original equation. So you need to know a of 0. A of 4.3990 and A of 10. Whoops, wrote that wrong. And you know I'm going to tell you the values now, aren't I? Okay, A of 0 you can do. You plug that in, you get 25 fourths, which for the benefit of decimals is 6.25. You plug in 4.3990, I have 3.5006. You can check these on the count there when you have time. I plug in 10, I get 
what was our question? Find where the string should be cut to maximize the combined area of the circle and the square. Where is our max here? Which one? 7.955 or 577. That is our max. And what is that? The max is 7.9577. Where should the string be cut? At 10 inches. And how long is the string? 10 inches. So all of that to say, if x is 10, are we cutting the string? If we want to maximize, the whole string should make the circle, and there should be no square. That's how we would maximize the area. The square just got ditched. We did all that work. We did all that work. How do we know it's the circle opposed to the square? We know it's a circle as opposed to the square because when I set this up, I used x and set x equal to the distance around the circle. And I set 10 minus x up to the distance around the square. You could have flip flopped it. I don't know how the math works out. But officially, yes, it could be flip flop. But would you still get the same? Like, you would only have a circle. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So I know it's a different problem to think about. So I'm going to write down here at 10 inches, as in that's where our um, maximum is or where we should cut. And so I'm going to say should not cut the string, use for circle. So again, what I just wrote is at 10 inches, you should not cut the string, use for the circle. I have two more examples to do. Oh my goodness. I may have to continue example four tomorrow, we'll see. Okay. Did we get that? I'm kind of scared to think about my online people right now. <laughs> They're sweating bullets right now. <laughs> and Ethan swears you're sweating bullets right now. <laughs> the good news is I am recording this, so the video will be there if there's pieces you need to go back and catch. Example three. Find the max and the min values of f on the interval negative 2 to 3, where f of x equals x to the 2 thirds. Okay. We need the max and the min value of f on this interval. What's key about this interval? What are these? These are endpoints. So what do we have to consider? We have to consider those as critical points. As well as, what else do I need to do here? We need to find the derivative so we can find our critical points. f of x equals x to the two-thirds. Derivative of x to the two-thirds. Two-thirds x to the negative one-third when you subtract one. Two-thirds minus three-thirds is negative one-third. We need to set that equal to zero. Now, as I set that equal to zero, this is two-thirds. What about that x to the negative one-third? Where does it go? To the denominator, right? So I'm going to write this out as two over three times the cube root of x, if you will. 
because x to the one third is a cube root. How do I make that equation equal zero? Well, let me ask you this. Can 2 divided by whatever this denominator is ever equal 0? No. How do you have a fraction equal 0? There has to be 0 where? On top. Do I have 0 on top? No, I have 2 on top. So this is a case where this cannot happen. And what that means is, will the deriv derivative equal zero? Whoops. No. So what we're going to say here is the derivative at zero, it does not exist. Okay? In other words, because when we set that derivative equal to zero, it can't happen. You can't get that fraction equal to zero because there's a two on top. Now, when we talk about that, there was three pieces, right? We had to consider endpoints, points where the derivative equals zero, and points where the derivative does not exist. So this still counts as a critical point because it's a point where the derivative does not exist. So in order to check which values are we checking, we have our endpoints of, well, I guess we have our critical point here of zero because the derivative does not exist there. We have to check our endpoints of negative two and of three. Okay, if I tell you those points real quick, f of zero equals zero f of negative 2, 1.5874. That was 1.5874. f of 3, 2.0801. We have a max. We have a min, correct? The min value happens at zero, where the derivative does not exist. And the max value happens at 2.0801. I'm going to say minimum value is zero. Maximum value is 2.0801. Okay, somehow or another, I am going to do this example with you. I'll either do a recording or I may just do it in class when I'm teaching tomorrow. I don't know. I'll figure it out, okay? I am going to do this lesson. Now, for the meantime, I'm going to say still do lesson homework, right? Okay, if it means there's something you have to skip, then you have to skip something. What, you know, no big deal there. Do the homework because you don't want to get behind on problem sets. Okay, do the homework. Lesson 63 for tomorrow. I do want to come back and do this somehow. Okay, it is important to me. Thanks for hanging with me today, guys. It was rough. I'm sorry. <laughs> I know it was rough. I'm well aware. Virtuals, anything I need to answer for you guys? This is probably a really rough one virtually. <laughs> Yes, definitely. I will either make a video of it and make you guys watch it on your own, or I will do it in class. I'd li ideally, I'd like to do it in class. But I'm just, I'm kind of stressing about where we're at on time and everything, but we'll figure it out. Okay? Hi, Maddie. I'm glad you could join us. So... Bye, girls. <laughs> See you guys later.